Music has charms to soothe the savage beast, but it also may be able to heal. The health benefits of music tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Music raises the human communication to a much higher level than just talking. The chords and notes embrace our emotions, the words can tell a narrative, and the tempo moves us figuratively and literally. We all have songs that, when we hear them, make us happy or sad by igniting memories of friends or events. People are just naturally drawn to music and how it touches our lives. But first, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Dot quiz question. True or false? A study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that children admitted to the emergency room department who listened to music during routine procedures did not have reduced distress and did not have lower pain scores. True or false? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays originally written for this show comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, we, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. Your questions or comments are key to our show discussion, especially tonight. Call and share your experiences with music. When you or a loved one were sick or injured, something about music. Tell us about the healthful effects of music in your life. Call 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org or send us an email to the address on the screen. This is your show. Tonight, music is a special topic. We need your help, your feedback, your stories. Joining us tonight is Dr. David Elson with Avera Health, a retired oncologist, and even better, a singer who plays the piano, and I think it's the baritone, isn't it, the baritone? A musician, and a longtime friend, and we, Franny Arneson was the scheduled guest for today, got sick this morning. Dave? Can you come up today? You've got a long time to prepare. And Dave said, yes, thank you so much for being our special guest for tonight. You're very welcome, Rick. I wouldn't miss it. I think about the times that you and I were, you brought it up in our discussion with the pre-med students. We're si sitting in the hot tub with Dr. Dave, uh, Tom Braithwaite, and, and Bob Surmeyer, and you and me, and we were singing hot tub harmony. <laughs> <laughs> Outside in, in uh, Spearfish Canyon. At the American College of Physician meetings. It was a, a real annual experience. event. Yes. Yeah, we did Wonderful. that every year for quite a few years. <laughs> so, and then it, when you were the governor of the, the state, you did a piano presentation. We did our barbershop quartet singing, and we did uh, a brass choir. A brass choir. So I thought, who could be better than an oncologist? <laughs> One of the most compassionate men I know to speak to us about music in your, in your experience in caring for people. Tell us a little bit about your oncology practice. Well, I did retire uh, in July of 2016, but prior to that I'd been in practice in Sioux Falls from 1980 until then, so I think I was 35, 36 years. years in the, in, right. Yeah, and seen a lot of changes in that time, and uh, thankfully a, a lot of huge improvements both in terms of the caliber of medicine we were able to provide to patients and of course the facilities you know which helped right. but um, I think you know over the years the uh, chemotherapy programs improved we developed got access to ways to uh, mitigate side effects from chemotherapy because of better nausea anti-nausea drugs and drugs to help keep the white blood count up and then you know toward the end of my practice career we were actually migrating away from traditional chemotherapy to uh, oral chemotherapy drugs called ty tyrosine kinase inhibitors that seem to more 
selectively target the uh, aberrant pathways in cancer cells and try to, you know, turn them off. And then at the very end, uh, we were getting into the area of immune-based therapy, something they call checkpoint inhibitors that sort of help the body reestablish anti-tumor immunity, which is something that cancer cells learn to turn off, and we've figured out some drugs that turn them back on. And so that, I think those are all incredibly exciting uh, aspects of the evolution of cancer medicine over the years. And, you know, I think it's been uh, documented, actually, that the um, age-adjusted cancer-related mortality has really dropped over the last few uh, years. Death rate from cancer has really improved, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, uh, and part of that is, you know, due to better screening and early detection, but a lot of it is actually due to better therapy, yeah. uh, which is quite a step up. Uh, we had Mayo Clinic doctors here uh, a month ago or something, the surgeon that did the Whipple procedure on me. The, my Avera surgeon sent me to him because of the anatomy that I had. And he said, it, the surgery's good, but you've got to have the chemo to prevent the spread of it. And without the chemo, it's a, it, it, we would have the same very poor mortality. And, and he really gave chemo bet, a better sound and more support than I've ever heard it before. Chemotherapy, which people reject and hate and it causes nausea and hair loss and all these suffering things. But we're better at it now. It's right. not quite as hard on you. Exactly. Yeah, just come a long, long ways, really. In that. Now, I'll be, now, before we go into music, I wanted to make a comment. Sometimes oncologists will provide options of therapy because they can, because there's always another option when we shouldn't be. I think they still do that some. What's your comment about that? Did, should we allow people to die at the end of their lives a little bit better than we've been in the past? I guess I would say the short answer certainly is yes. You know, I think the there are a couple of issues that, you know, I think we in the cancer community, uh, cancer doctor community could have addressed better over the years. Uh, one of them was the concept of dose intensity in treating cancer because, right. you know, uh, when cancer therapy evolved, the drugs that worked first were the drugs that were active against the most chemosensitive tumor types, you right. know, and that was acute leukemia in children and then testicular cancer in, uh, in men and some of the lymphomas, Hodgkin's right. and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, so it turned out that with chemosensitive tumors, you could get, you know, marginally higher cure rates by using a higher dose of drugs. Right. Uh, and in some instances, even going to uh, bone marrow transplant doses, you know. Right. Uh, but the dilemma was that it's although it was not unnatural to expect they would but the cancer research community kind of took those same concepts and tried to apply it to all the common solid tumors that we deal with in the geriatric population yeah. so that would be you know colon cancer and breast cancer and lung cancer for example prostate cancer and uh, you know, my sense over the years of practice was that a lot of the protocols that were evolved for treating those types of advanced cancer where you couldn't go with curative and with, you didn't think you could cure them, was they still believed that you should give them the highest dose that the patient could stand. And, uh, you know, I, as I pr developed my own ideas over 35 years of practice, I kind of realized that what we really needed in that setting was the lowest dose that would work. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, and we drag so, people through a lot of stuff. And so I think you know that that would be one thing is you could change is that in a lot of these uh, more ad, advanced uh, solid tumors solid tumors dose reduction actually is a good thing for patients yeah. and giving lower doses more often rather than high doses all at once you know could be helpful. But I think, as I mentioned, the whole paradigm is shifting anyway because 
we're kind of getting away from traditional chemotherapy in that setting and going more to these targeted treatments yeah. that are that are by their definition a little bit more low dose chronic therapy. Yeah. And and then there is the issue of okay, time to not try another thing. Right. Let's go and, with comfort care. Right. And I you know, I think that's a very individualized decision. I mean, the dilemma is that, you know, if you tell a patient that they have a 10% chance of responding to therapy and that the response duration is going to be an extra three to six months, you know, most people will say, I, I'd rather just be comfortable. Uh, but there'll be a few people who say, you know, give me, the 10%. give me the 10%. But then the other issue is, um, when we talk about symptom control, you know, as an oncologist, I would say that if, you, if you're able to give a therapy to a patient comfortably that induces a, a partial response, it can actually make their quality of life better yeah. by relieving tumor-associated symptoms. True. So there's and, a reason to do it for symptoms. Right. And so I think it's, it's not always cut and dried. I mean, I, I always told patients, you know, with advanced cancer where we were going without curative intent, that my primary goal with treatment was to help them feel better yeah. and stay functional. It yeah. wasn't really to extend their life. Make and you that, feel better. Right. That's and if it. we if we couldn't and I always told them if we can't give you a therapy in a way that's reasonably comfortable for you, now you know uh, we couldn't say side effect free, because that's not possible, but but in many instances, if you could figure out a way to give it that was reasonably comfortable, you could actually end up helping their quality of life while continuing with therapy. So, yeah. so that's the judgment call, yeah. you know. But at a certain point, you know, if a person's performance status is declined to the point that they're nearly bedridden, or if they're, you know, very elderly and even low doses of the side of the drugs are causing bad side effects, you know, you, it's much better to just say let's focus on comfort care, which is kind of, thankfully, the program, uh, the point of hospice care and right. something that has evolved over the years. You know, we didn't have that in the first 15 years yeah. of my practice life, no. but after that. We're doing better on We're hospice. doing better, yeah. much better. Music, yeah. did we do much music therapy? I know they've got a music therapy thing at Avera and at Sanford, I think, too. What, what, uh, do we, did we do much of that during your time? Uh, well, um, not in the first half of my career, but yeah. in the second half, this concept of uh, uh, integrative medicine or you know ancillary programs mm -hmm. that were not tr just traditional chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, but other things that might help the quality of life of uh, cancer patients yeah. really started Stand to to avalanche. evolve. And uh, you know, th th there is data on things like acupuncture, you know, helping with symptoms. There's data on uh, exercise therapy is huge. I mean, in fact, mm -hmm. exercise is very helpful for cancer patients, and it can take other forms, not just uh, uh, machines and running, but it can be things like yoga, uh, dance, and and then music therapy has been shown to be helpful in s situations to reduce anxiety right. and to uh, help with pain control. Yep. So, very very important. Very important. In an effort to better apply music therapy as a treatment, a relatively new area of study has evolved. There's a lot of scientific support for music therapy because um, our profession has worried and been concerned about um, being an evidence-based, um, clinically proven profession. Some of the greatest evidence most recently has been help improving social skills in children with autism with social songs, um, helping seniors experience elevated mood through reminiscence and music therapy, and then also there's different research with rehabilitation that neurologists are doing through neurologic music therapy and that's helping folks walk again. Um, there does need to be a medical need um, or a mental health need for music therapy. So I'll try and demonstrate here one of the techniques that we're trained in using um, is music imagery. And usually this involves helping a client become more relaxed in, an, in a more relaxed state. And so they may have experienced anxiety or pain. Um, it's difficult 
to do this intervention with folks who have a loss of um, sense of reality or orientation. And so I kind of base my judgment on if I can do it with that client. But typically I help them get into a relaxed position and try and um, kind of find their grounding in their chair. And then I just begin playing some um, chords and I'll, you'll see the rest. And then I just have them close their eyes and listen to me. You know that music just throws me into a different, different, different mood. realm. Yeah, that's you know lovely. that la la la. So um, this is your show. Your questions. We're getting some responses. Please send your comments uh, or your questions about music therapy, cancer therapy. Call and share your experiences with music. When you or a loved one were sick or injured, tell us about the healthful effects of music in your life. Call one eight eight eight. 376-6225 or send us an email to ask at on call with the prairie doc. Uh, we I before the show we meet with uh, our our doctor guests meet with pre med students, and we went around the room, uh, and I mean to a person in the room they've all worked in a nursing home. It was just amazing to me, and uh, the question was to them: Have you seen an example? in the nursing home where music was helpful uh, and a home health, well this one was in a home health aide so she would go stay with this man for an hour once a week. Uh, an elderly man uh, who had a uh, significant brain injury and uh, he couldn't talk. He had almost no visual, verbal uh, words uh, but if you turned old country music on he knew the words. He didn't remember his family, but he remembered the words to the country music. I thought that was amazing. Another talked about uh, a, uh, a patient who uh, would have severe anxiety in the nursing home, and anytime they would try to clean her up or give her a uh, bed change or do something uh, that involved uh, with her, uh, she would scream. She had anxiety, panic, unless you sang, uh, uh, you are my sunshine. And then she would settle right on down and sing with you. Uh, we had another one who talked about an autos autistic neighbor uh, child who, who uh, ha had terrible situational anxiety. Uh, but if you've turned on Disney music, uh, he settled right on down. Uh, example after example of uh, church choir music, of uh, uh, singing, uh, calming the patient, uh, memory unit uh, experiences where uh, when the families all left after you know the Christmas day was over they would be anxious you're gonna leave us and then you'd turn on Christmas music and they would move with the with the Christmas music and and solve them uh, so it, I, I thought they were wonderful experiences that they shared Dave any any thoughts well the experiences I have are are more personal than with patients myself, but I've sung in the church choir for, you know, about 25 years, and I find that every time I go to choir practice, I feel so much better afterwards. <laughs> and and it's also been true when you go uh, sing carols, or I know you have a group that has gone to your uh, nursing home, and it, it just seems like there's a a, re, a release, a, a restful feeling, the anxiety issues, you know, it, you just feel better. And uh, I guess there's a line from my favorite all-time uh, music movie, August Rush, you know, where, the, where one character says, 
you just never give up on your music. It's the one place you can go when things are getting you down, and you know, it just you can just let it all go. So. That's, I, uh, I, I totally, I'm with you on that. My sense. Uh, is it, it, it's, it's a connection to God. I mean, there is a spiritual something about music that uh, really touches me. Uh, Facebook comment about music, my father in later years took to singing some of the old classic Southern Baptist hymns a cappella, which is without accompaniment at his home. At first I was a little embarrassed, but I saw that it bought, brought him great comfort, and then as a result, great comfort to me. Uh, I, I've often thought, you know, as, as an amateur uh, musician, uh, of course I should be embarrassed by <laughs> some of the. You know, we sing Christmas Eve, our our uh, my our sons and me. You know, the four of us. Uh, most Christmas Eve, we can get them all back or some of them back, and we we they, we have a gig every Christmas Eve to sing, and it's not always the best music. You know, it's not always great. We work on it that day, and but it's very very soothing to me, very uh, 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 important to me. Uh, we have some other comments. Talk about music therapy for those suffering with PTSD. You know, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. Uh, do you know any, any data on that, Dave? From what I reviewed today, uh, you know, I didn't see anything specific to that, but it, it seems intuitive that if it helps with you know anxiety issues that it in other areas it probably helps there too so and I, I would be almost certain that it's being tried in some of our VA medical centers right. so uh, I think they're the only downside would be in the in some of the VA centers maybe because of funding issues you know you don't know uh, how much music therapy is available I think what we found is that many of the music therapy programs even in the community hospitals and the academic medical centers actually have private philanthropic funding, funding. because yes. there isn't really uh, as know, much health as insurance funding for that. going to pay for it. Exactly. It's, a, it's a brand new field. Right. You know, the, the, the proof that it makes a difference. Although the field uh, and the, of music therapy, and I looked this up, started at the VA hospital. And they looked at all these vets who were uh, after World War One, and then it, it was fired up again after World War Two, they would come back, you know, with shell shock and emotional trauma as well as as physical trauma, and they would bring professionals to sing for them, and uh, they had maybe a little bit better funding in the VA than we have out in the real on, uh, outside world, well, that, outside the VA. That's VA is the real world too. But right. in prior times, that's true. I was just thinking lately. The, Everything has been a little bit dialed back funding-wise, but in the past, that's true. Certainly know. true. Yeah. Caller from Parkson asked if music therapy has been used with people who have Parkinson's disease. Seems to help my father with his movement disorder. I have to give this experience. Uh, I was, uh, this was probably late 80s, and uh, a wonderful woman, her last name is Harris, had Parkinson's disease. She's gone now. But she would come to our state medical association meetings, and she had progressively worsening Parkinson's, and uh, uh, she, her medicine was waning. The Parkinson medicines only last about an hour or two, and then it goes away, and it, it's on, and then it's off, and then you end up frozen. And she was trying to stand up to get ready to leave the dance. We were at a dance, and um, and I saw, why don't you join me? and we'll dance a little bit before you go. Just try it, and maybe it'll work. I had no idea. We'll just stand there and move with the music. It's gotta be soothing. So we started moving with the music and she started able to move with me and pretty soon, she's moving like she hasn't moved in years. <laughs> and she went, wow, we gotta tell somebody about this. This is wonderful uh, in her Parkinson way, except that her, her speech was better too. Everything was better. We danced. She wouldn't let me go. We danced for like three songs, and then finally she left. And now I know that it's part of the Parkinson's treatment. But I have to say, I fell upon it. I didn't know about it. Well, I don't think it was known back then. <laughs> it was one of those yeah. great stories. And, and, and I mean, you know, I loved her so much, and I, was, I knew she was suffering from this. And I thought, you know, I'll just hold you, and we'll rock. 
<laughs> we danced. Well, I have a comment here. Please send your comments. one 376 6225 Story about music. When her mother was in her 80s, her fingers knew how to play, to play the piano and always would ask her daughter what song she was playing since her mind couldn't remember, but her fingers did. So she'd be playing the song and she would say to her daughter, what's the name of the song? Yeah. And uh, when she was moved into the nursing home, her mother would play for the Alzheimer's residents and they would sing all the words to the old hymns with her. The night before she died, the daughter sat with her and they sang all the old hymns in harmony with an Alzheimer's resident. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, actually, that does remind me, I, I sadly uh, lost my sister this last year to a, a recurrence of a melanoma. She had had one on the bottom of her foot 20 years ago, and then it kind of came back a year ago oh, uh, no, as a I couple didn't. of spots uh, under the skin on the leg and uh, a large spot in the brain. And despite uh, neurosurgery and radiation and some immunotherapy, it didn't all take. And uh, But right toward the end of her life, she was at home with hospice. And uh, she was having problems with intermittent confusion. But she sat down to the piano and played a couple of her favorite songs for the family quite flawlessly. So Isn't that it, amazing? Yeah, really know, near it, the end of her life. Yeah. Yeah. But her main her brain was not working well with that part, but the the, the music part was the music good. came through. Yep. And that meant that meant a lot to her sons that were able to be there and hear that, oh. you know. Um, I was sitting next to a uh, a friend of mine from Brookings. Uh, Mary said that her mother just recently died of Alzheimer's disease. She hadn't uh, spoken in eight or 10 years. And the minister had been there maybe five years or so and came to uh, her mother's side and would, hadn't heard her ever speak. And uh, uh, just not too long before she died, uh, he said, let's say the Lord's Prayer. And he started saying the Lord's Prayer. And this woman who hadn't spoken in 10 years repeated the Lord's Prayer with him. Wow. <laughs> and of course, that was the sermon for the coming Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and the daughter and the family all wept with that story. Right. But it's another part of the brain. It's that same part of the brain uh, that uh, goes with uh, music, music, I think. Yeah. Uh, the people who, who talk about the Lord's Prayer say, it's the whom. If you're, you know, other other religions have talked about this womb that you have, this this uh, meditation uh, words that that brings everybody to a sense of unity, and I I sense it with the Lord's Prayer, mm -hmm. but I think that other religions have the same thing. Here's a story. Many years ago, a husband dying of cancer in the hospital was not talking. His son came in and brought a guitar and started strumming. The husband leaned forward a bit and said the lyrics of the song to his wife, have I told you lately that I love you? <laughs> oh. Isn't that a great story? That's a wonderful story. Um, so I think about uh, uh, the music uh, and uh, recently uh, in the hospice that I group that I'm the medical director for the hospice. I haven't let that go. Mm. There is a harp that is made at musicmakers.org, which is a group I've known for years and years because they make kits. And I've made a, I've made, uh, a bass fiddle. I've made uh, music stands. Uh, I've made a banjo. <laughs> and recently, I made a mandolin from a kit, musicmakers.org, or look it up, Music Makers. But they make a harp for hospice groups. And it can do, you know, they can have this beautiful song and you just give it to the person. They can play that harp all day long if they'd like. Or you can do it in two key, you can tune it to two keys. So it's a, it's a G chord and a, and a D7, you know, so that you've got the, the major chord and then you've got the seventh chord to want to bring you back and then you can Go back and forth. A sure. million songs with those two chords. Uh, so uh, 
we've been we've been talking about that, and I, I want you to look into that. The the uh, music makers, mm -hmm. there is a uh, you can go on the internet and find it. Many years ago, a husband dying of cancer in the hospital. Oh, we said that one. Have I told you lately that I love you? Uh, let's go to the next uh, one. As a nurse, she was working in hospice as spirituality coordinator and used music therapy often. An elderly patient hadn't talked for a long time. Other workers said there's no use to go talk to him. He was curled up in bed, and she sat down with him and her ukulele and played Jesus Loves Me. With his eyes closed, he starts singing along. The first time he had talked in many months. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but uh, uh, it brings that out of people. I mean, your sister's similar. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I haven't uh, personally, because I was working more in the clinic in the hospital rather than in the hospice per se, but uh, I, I certainly have heard anecdotal stories that support that, and I think uh, you know, I don't, we haven't really talked about the swan song. Yeah, thing tell me about bit, the swan song. But I think it, it, it's a good lead in for it because it's kind of got an interesting South Dakota, South Dakota connection too. Right. Uh, um, many people in the audience probably are familiar with uh, South Dakota music in the form of the Red Willow Band years ago and the Acoustic Christmas Program. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, one of the uh, fantastic musicians in that group, Chris Gage, uh, originally from Pier, moved at one, some point down to Texas, to Austin, and he's extremely well known and recognized there. And uh, he uh, is with a, a lady, Christine Albert, who uh, is also a fantastic musician in her own right, a wonderful singer and writer. And she started a program in Austin uh, called Swan Songs. And it was kind of named for a gentleman, Mr. Swan, who was one of her patients, and he gave her an endowment to expand the program. Mm -hmm. And they essentially have a website and set it up so that people who are in home hospice or in a hospice cottage, Doherty House, for example, Doherty House, for example, who want uh, music can call, and they can put in a request for you know what type of song they'd like to hear, and this organization will arrange for a musician or musicians to come out and and provide them a miniature concert and uh -huh. and it's really had a big impact on the uh, patients in the Austin area and uh, Christine is well known in the music industry in general and she got started getting lots of requests to expand her program to other cities and she was hesitant to do it because um, she wasn't sure she'd be able to guarantee that it was done well but because of her affiliation with the acoustic Christmas program here in South Dakota and uh, actually, a, a Brookings native, Robin Prunty, who yeah, uh, Robin Prunty, uh, yeah, who uh, has been the uh, she's uh, a Brookings girl, yeah, uh, right. She had been a so, kind of the administrator for the Christmas uh, acoustic Christmas. Christmas people when they came. She helped organize the logistics, and she works with the Avera Foundation. She kind of talked to Christine and said, "We could do this at Avera at the Do Doherty House," and so. Uh, they actually have started that program in the last two years and uh, have a music therapist uh, on staff there wow. and they've had uh, some very successful fundraisers to help provide some funding to support the program yeah. because again it's it's uh, requires philanthropic support I think the last uh, one was a Jerry Jeff Walker concert at the pavilion this summer and I'm sorry uh, I missed it. Yeah, I was lucky enough to be there. It was wonderful. Chris Gage do, ba, does backup for him wow. a lot and he's, it was a terrific program. So, Swan Swan Song. Swan Song. Yeah. Well, what do people who work in music professionally think the medical effects of music are? I don't think anybody can say that, that medically they were healed because of music, but it's because of experiencing music or because of uh, performing certain styles of music that perhaps really helped them. I have a, a dear friend, Sylvia McNair, who's a professional singer, who is a colleague of mine from Indiana University, where I did my undergraduate and master's degrees. And she uh, was an opera singer for years, and she, she still is a very famous singer, was diagnosed with breast cancer. 
and credits her singing and her music and her performing with getting her through bouts of chemotherapy and getting her through the tragedy of that kind of illness. She credits music and uh, perhaps listening more to it as she was in treatment and then changing her style as she finished because she knew that she couldn't use the same kind of energy to sing uh, fully operatic with the kind of velocity, air velocity that it takes to do that. And so she changed her style so she could continue to communicate musically because that was healing for her. And in the same way, her fantastic music, musicianship and musical ability really speaks to her audiences. When I think about performing versus listening in music as far as a healing effect, I believe that they each have their own place. I think as a performer, I've done quite a bit of perform performing myself. I. Um, I certainly get so much when I give back my gift to my audience, when I give it to the audience or when I give it to even my children, when I give it to my friends. But as a listener, and I've certainly sat in audiences listening to some of the, mo the finest opera singers in the world, um, it's just overwhelming. It cut when you hear Dolores Ogic sing Aida full force, it's just, it's sort of like that Memorex commercial where the, the young man is sitting in the chair and his hair is blowing back, you just are overtaken by that sound, by that singer. And so it affects both the listener and the performer in, in different ways. I hesitate to use the word healed, but I say touched and, and, and really uh, spoken to in their heart. But the people that are doing the performing as well are truly touched when they see this kind of a reaction uh, around them. You have friends that will go and visit and they'll sing a familiar hymn tune and the Alzheimer's person will, will recall that tune and sing it. That certainly doesn't heal the person that has Alzheimer's, but it's so healing for those people that are in the room to see and hear their loved ones sing again and recall memories and times when they spent time together. And that's something that our friend Dr. Rick Holm does um, on Tuesday evening with his Hopeful Spirit Chorale. I think everyone should sing. But that's me, right? I think, I think from from the very earliest, from from infancy, when a, when a, when a child is babbling and just making cooing sounds to mom or dad, that's music to to me. Or when I have a 92-year-old grandma singing Amazing Grace, that's beautiful music to me. You know, they say that the most important thing we can do in medicine is to, to diminish suffering and enhance health. And of course, you and I have tried to enhance health all the way along this whole healing thing, but half of what we should be doing is diminishing suffering. And my sense is we, the solid science of proof of this or that is not always there, but we know this helped diminish suffering. Yeah. Uh, my, uh, I, my oldest son, uh, our middle son, and our youngest son, uh, my, our, our three sons, uh, are musicians. Our daughter is, loves to listen and is a country music enjoyer, but she's not the musician that the other, although she played the piano a lot when I, I pushed her to play the piano. Anyway, the, our oldest son has uh, taken to uh, singing for zero to two-year-olds and has classes every weekday, maybe two to four classes depending upon uh, how many he can get in, in uh, New York City and takes donations as people come in. And it's, it's, it's been a wonderful avocation for him. Uh, and the, uh, as a theater director, you know, there it is. He's, he's singing for zero to two-year-olds. But they come, the mothers pay the money and bring their babies because they know they're, the science is not so solid, but it's there that our children are going to develop and grow and be enhanced by learning music that, that young. We have a comment here. A professional musician would like to say that music has given her a focus, fulfilled an intellectual curiosity, is very emotional, soothes her soul, and is fun. As a child, she grew up in an abusive home. She'd close the door, play the piano to enter her own world. Music saved her from entering into an abusive world and escaped that abusive world. Isn't that amazing? Your comment about abuse, I've never heard music and abuse used before. 
it's uh, like you say, I think it's it's kind of tied up with the whole human spirit in a way that's different than many other things that we can do. And, uh, you know, I think it really does help people feel well at a deeper level. Yeah. So this uh, Hopeful Spirit Chorale has been going on for quite a few years, and we meet on a Tuesday at 7. We practice 15, 20 minutes, and then we go to somebody's home or the nursing home or the hospital. And it isn't... It isn't always someone who is uh, dying of cancer. It could be somebody who has, is just uh, uh, recovering from a broken hip. Uh, sometimes it's a person who is, uh, just needs a little lift or would enjoy that singing. And it's been such a joy to me and to the singers, really. You get more than you give on those scenarios. I, I just have to, I, I thanks for that, that little bit of, well, well, you know, just falling back into medicine a little bit, you know, I think the fact that there is a fair consensus that integrative therapy like music therapy uh, can really help reduce anxiety and pain, if that reduces the amount of narcotics that we have to use in, in a lot of different medical settings, that can be huge, you know, it's because a, we all know narcotics are sedating and constipating and nauseating. You know, they're just not free drugs by any means. 65,000 deaths a year from it at this point. Right, in the, because of the issues of abuse and overdosing and habituation. And so if we can use any of these other things, whether it's yoga or meditation or music or exercise, to uh, raise those natural endorphins and and uh, help re relieve discomfort by that means, that's a real win. That's a win. We have a comment from an elementary music teacher of 30 years. She'd like to say that it wasn't a job, but a joy. All children can succeed in music, and it broke down all barriers between children. I know there, you know, we may not have a ton of data on the older population, but boy, uh, music teachers are in every school. And uh, kids uh, get confidence from it. It touches a part of their soul that means, makes the, the day a better day. Uh, and as she said, it was a joy. <laughs> Isn't that, that's a beautiful comment. We have a comment from, uh, oh, and I want to thank Laura Diddle for her comments. There is a head of SDSU Choral Music, uh, a lovely woman inside and out, and her thoughts about how it helps people uh, more than having a profession and more than having a choir group that, by the way, just can knock your socks off uh, when, you, when they perform. A woman living at St. Martin's Senior Village says there's a small singing group of 20 with piano and accordion. Everyone loves it and is having so much fun doing it. Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, recently I was asked to review Atul Gawande's Being Mortal. And an honors uh, college group asked me to, to go with them on that discussion because they'd all been read the book and had a lot of talk about it. And of course, everybody uh, praises that book. But I have to say that Atul was not very positive about nursing homes uh, or assisted livings. I mean, he talked about good situations in the Edom uh, au auction uh, alternative. But um, uh, basically, he was not happy about it. And he was not happy about end of life, and he was angry about his father's death. It's a tremendous book, but you also have to see the, the part that it, it, he was tearing up. He was angry when he wrote that book. Uh, and if you think about nursing homes or assistant living, many people truly enjoy it. It's a wonderful place. And music is a part of every nursing home, every mm -hmm. assistant living. Uh, it's wonderful. Any comment about that? Brief comment. Well, I've seen that in my own life because my mother-in-law was in a nursing home in a little town in northwest Iowa this last year, and uh, she got amazing care and a lot of support for, through a very difficult end-of-life situation with cancer. Yeah. Uh, I guess what I'd say is that clearly the data on long-term care is mixed across the country. I think in the upper Midwest, you yeah. know, we're kind of blessed because we have a lot of things going for us, like intact families and people who care about each other. And, and really good nursing homes. Really good nursing homes <laughs> because 
you know, the people that work there view it as a more than just a job, it's also a calling. Yes. Because you really are taking care of the the weakest of our the weakest of us at a time when they're under stress and, and you know it's a very hard job I mean you couldn't get up and do it every day unless it was a calling as well as a job I totally agree with you we use music in neonatal intensive care units uh, it helps calm this is another caller it helps calm infants and helps to cover all the sounds of the ICU like beeps and ventilator sounds and voices and I, I can just see that happening. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I remember the Neo at, uh, intensive care unit at Grady Hospital when I was a student, but boy, we didn't have music then, but I'm glad we do now. A viewer from Facebook asked if the genre of music you listen to impacts its healing effects. What I think, uh, and I'll just, one sentence, Dave. I think rock and roll and, and uh, fires you up, probably not soothing and calming. <laughs> right. <laughs> but when you want to be fired up, that's what it does. Just think about the music in the Olympics and the dancing, how beautiful it is and how all the countries are using music from everywhere. And, you know, the Beatles uh, by the Chinese and, and uh, so on and so forth. I took my daughter from age 16 to 19 to Mayo Clinic every other month, which is a terrible trying time. In all the buildings, there are pianos in the hallways, and they encourage patients to play the piano and the music resonance through the marble hallways. It would be so uplifting when you were there for such sad times. Employees were even playing all, at times. The joy of music shared between all of the people there was powerful and uplifting. And I'll just tell you, Dick Hanks, a classmate of mine in college, came to visit me at the Mayo Clinic when I was there. Vera sent me to the Mayo for the surgery because of my anatomy. And he and I sang in their front entrance to St. Mary's on the fourth day post-op, and it was wonderful. A barbershop quartet were singing at a nursing home, and as they were about to leave, the nurse asked them if they could sing a, for a lady down the hall. They walked in, sang a couple numbers, and the lady sang along with them. They left and were later notified that the lady had been mute for several months. She was singing and talking a mile a minute after they left. Music had the ability to dig deep and reach parts inside her soul. We had a Parkinson's patient who really was declining, picked up when we sang to him and waited for us the next day. A woman from Huron had a surgery in her carotid, can I keep going, uh, artery and lost her voice for five months. She grew up in a musical family and one morning after the surgery she tried to sing but sounded like a frog. However, she continued to sing and eventually her voice came back. I love that story. Uh, and all right, and now, and now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. True or false? A study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that children admitted to the emergency room department who listened to music during routine procedures didn't have reduced distress and did not have lower pain scores. True or false? And the answer, Dave? False, yeah. False. <laughs> I wanted you to hear that. The study indeed found less distress, less pain in children listening to music compared to those who did not listen to music in the emergency room. It was Diane Jurgensen from Worthington, Minnesota, who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Diane, for participating. And a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. In a world where selfies are seemingly innocent, something lurks. And no one is spared. How goes it? It's flu season. When asking a group of friends how important music is to them, I heard a lot of answers. Music must live in our brain, somewhere close to where emotions reside. Think of how the plot of a movie is moved by the music from the Wizard of Oz. Over the and Jaws to, to Star Wars the sound of music. The hills are alive with the sound of music. 
One friend told me, I have music in my life every day. My wife Joni said, if I'm in a grumpy mood, put on a waltz and my bad mood just goes away. Another friend said, music dips into the deepest aspect of my soul. Almost everyone enjoys music of some type, whether it be classical, country, hip-hop, blues, and jazz. But music is much more than for enjoyment. It enhances feelings and memories of suspense, fear, compassion, sadness, and happiness. There is scientific data to show that music therapy significantly helps improve physical, cognitive, emotional, and social well-being. Music therapy is commonly prescribed for treating medical illnesses, physical and developmental disabilities, psychiatric disorders, and neurologic impairment. Music therapists are now working in hospitals, psychiatric centers, nursing homes, rehab centers, schools, daycare facilities, substance abuse centers, and hospice programs. I have the privilege to sing with a voice-only choir called the Hopeful Spirit Chorale. Almost every week we sing for an individual at home, in the hospital or nursing home, receiving help from hospice, recovering from an illness, or just a person who simply would appreciate it. We sing well-known hymns and non-religious songs, mostly in four-part harmony. One choir member said, we're caring people, lifting the spirits of others with a nice gift of music. However, the music is one of those gifts that gives back to the singers way more than is given. There is an unexplainable thing that often happens with that choir when the music is just right. A spiritual connection shivers through everyone's bones. Tears may flow, and the individual and family feels loved. I know this doesn't work for everyone, but when I try to define what God is to me, the great mystery is at least partially explained when, in song, the harmonic spirit embraces my soul and brings balm to my fears and suffering. We had several comments I didn't get, but we're going to try to put them on Facebook and on our internet site, prairiedoc.org. A big thank you to our guest, Dr. Dave Elson, for joining us in the studio tonight. We've all heard that the flu vaccine this year isn't as effective as we would have hoped, but about 36% at least uh, work. But it will still help your immune system fire up and resist infections and reduce the time and symptoms if you do come down with the flu. If you haven't had it, your vaccination yet, get it now. It's worse this year than it's been for years. The shot will prevent many illness, many illnesses, hospitalizations, deaths in, from influenza. And wash your hands, cough into your sleeve if you're sick. Don't go to work or school. Well, that does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. For sissies, how right she was. Perils of aging, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, the American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation, and the South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, 
Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Cobank, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Black Hills Medical Society, Third District Medical Society, Brookings, Madison, and Flandreau, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Swiftel Communications. Thank you.